So today for 1 D&D, I'm here with Jeremy Crawford, and we are talking about how 1 D&D is going, how the playtest is being received. We've got some scores, right? There's, there's, we, we know things now about how this process is going, correct? Absolutely. So we have now had a chance to analyze the feedback to the very first Unearthed Arcana in this series, the Unearthed Arcana that was called Character Origins. We have compiled the satisfaction scores, our staff has also combed through the written responses. And so we now have a very clear idea of how the D&D community responded to that first stage of this playtest process. And so I'm super excited to share uh, so share yeah. some of what we learned. Yeah, what, what have you learned? <laughs> so first off, the level of engagement was through the roof. Uh, over 40,000 people engaged with the survey. About 39,000 completed the whole thing. And so first, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, who filled out that survey. Uh, I know it can take some time to do it. It's invaluable for us. Uh, we not only look at all the scores, we dig into what people have written. This really helps us get a sense of where does the community want D&D &D to go next? So again, big thanks to everyone who participated. And it was a ton of people who participated, which means the satisfaction scores that we have are quite persuasive given how many people participated. So first, uh, how about I tell you the thing that scored the highest. Yeah, I'm very curious. <laughs> in the whole UA. So the thing that scored the highest, almost reaching 90% satisfaction, was getting a first level feat in your background. This is a great example of a kind of experimental thing that we will sometimes put out there. Way back for the D&D Next playtest, an example of an experimental thing where we truly weren't sure how the audience was going to respond was the advantage and disadvantage mechanic, which are now a core part of the game because fan satisfaction was so high. I frankly expected fans to be satisfied with getting a first level feat in their background. What I did not expect is that the satisfaction would be this high. I mean, who doesn't like free things? So. Well, <laughs> again, there, it, it was an open question because, yeah. uh, you know, some groups prefer not to use feats, which is one of the reasons why we're yeah. very carefully threading this needle of, all right, you get this free one, so we're not going to require you to engage with the feat system repeatedly unless you really want to, but we also want to give you that taste so that you can then make an informed decision about whether or not you later engage uh, with feats. Feats also, as you and I have chatted before about, are a great way for us to communicate some concrete things that each background is good at. Uh, so I'm excited to see how much the community is embracing getting a feat as a part of a character's background. Here's the thing. That scored super high. Right. What was amazing is almost everything did. So the majority of the things in this Unarked Arcana scored 80% or higher. So before I go any further about the scores of specific things, I think it's important to talk about what do these the, the numbers themselves mean. Yeah, you and I have talked about this at length. So usually 70% or higher, right? Yeah, 70% or higher is what we're looking for. When something scores in the 70s, we see that as the community giving a thumbs up, but that also means there's still some tinkering for us to do. Uh, sometimes very minor tinkering or moderate tinkering. But the core message is the community is saying, yes, more of this. As soon as a score hits 80% or higher, now we're going into the realm of not only do, does the community want more of that, 
but they want exactly that. So what that means for us as a design team is when we look at a thing that gets 80% satisfaction or higher, we then tread very carefully in our further development to make sure we don't change it too much. It might still be changed in minor ways for balance reasons, for cohesion reasons, you know, making sure the different parts of the game are functioning well together. But as soon as you're into that 80% area, uh, or even more especially if you make it into the 90s, that is basically the community saying, yes, this. Uh, now, when we go below 70, when we're in the 60s, something in the 60s we consider to be salvageable, that you know, there, there are enough people interested in the thing that maybe there's something there for us to save, mm -hmm. but we need to really reconsider many aspects of the design. Anything that scores below 60%, like when we're in the 50s, good chance we're not gonna do anything with it. Mm -hmm. And if it's in the 40s and below, it's pretty much gone. Uh, it got dusted <laughs> by the, the community cast disintegrate on it. <laughs> and, and the dust is there. Now, Never I, to be spoken of again. <laughs> yeah. Now, I have to say it is extremely rare for anything to be in that category. Uh, most things that we send out uh, in Unearthed Arcana uh, end up in the sort of 60, 70, and 80 range. It's ex really rare for something to hit into the 50s and even rarer for something to be uh, lower than that. Uh, but again, what was remarkable when we got the scores back for this UA is how many things uh, were 80% or higher. Uh, and again, the first level feat was at 87%. So again, inching toward 90% uh, satisfaction, uh, which is a, a ringing endorsement uh, for that piece of design. Would you like to hear about some other scores? I would, I would love to. I, I'm curious what's low? <laughs> what so, was low? So uh, yeah, that's a great question uh, and easy to address because so little was low. So first off, nothing uh, was in the 50s or below. Uh, we had among the, the various main options, there were only three things that dipped into the 60s. Mm -hmm. So one of those was the D20 test rule uh, that was in the rules glossary was not a surprise to us. Yeah. You and I talked when we introduced <laughs> that, highly experimental. Yeah. I didn't actually expect what we were doing there with the uh, auto, you know, a one for all D20 tests being a failure, a 20 for all D20 tests being a success, uh, the way critical hits were working. You and I talked about it. Yeah. Highly experimental, which often in our conversations in these videos, when I say that, that means I won't be surprised if it doesn't yeah. make it. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, is we often like to do what's called A-B testing. Mm -hmm. we, we like to present two very different versions of something and then compare the community's response to them. Which is why in the very next Unearthed Arcana, before we'd even delved into the feedback for the first one, we presented a different version of the D20 test rule. And I am expecting once the survey closes for the expert classes UA, that we'll see a very different score for the D20 test. So again, the, the D20 test rule being in the 60s, not a surprise. Well, was there anything that was a surprise? Uh, no, um, other than, okay, there is one surprise <laughs> here among, so only again, three things that were in the 60s. The surprise is about the next two about their relative relationships to each other in the 60s. So the other two things that were in the 60% range mm -hmm. were the Ardling mm -hmm. and the Dragonborn. And the big surprise here is the Dragonborn scored lower than the Ardling. Oh. So I was ready for the Ardling, which was totally new. Uh, I mean, really it was just, ta-da, here's yeah. a brand new option. <laughs> yeah. We're, anytime we do that, we are prepared for response to be all over the map. So it's really hard to surprise us with, 
you know, whether it's super, uh, you know, approving or super disapproving, mm -hmm. totally new things, uh, always a big question mark over them. And so we're prepared for essentially any response. What surprised us was that the Dragonborn, which is well established in the game, scored lower than the Ardling. Uh, and they were both in the 60s, so that means they're both salvageable, but we then need to dig into what needs to happen next. And people are going to get to see what's going to happen next in our next Unearthed Arcana, right. which will include new versions of both the Ardling and the Dragonborn. Now, I can tell you now, and maybe in our video for that UA, we can dig a little deeper. I can tell you now that as we dug into the written responses about the Ardling and the Dragonborn, I can sum up pretty easily why we think they both of those options landed in the 60s. For the Dragonborn, it's really simple. It's the breath weapon. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, dissatisfaction about the implementation of the breath weapon, so we are addressing that head-on in the next version. There was also some confusion in the feedback about the relationship of this new version of the Dragonborn to the Dragonborn options that appear in Fisben's Treasury of Dragons. Right. And so this is a great time for me to clarify that Whatever new version of something we present in the 2024 Player's Handbook can stand alongside options like those that appear in Fisben's Treasury of Dragons. You can really think of the Player's Handbook Dragonborn as sort of being the universal Dragonborn, whereas the Dragonborn options in Fisben's are very intentionally more targeted, you know, specifically a metallic Dragonborn, a chromatic Dragonborn, a gem Dragonborn those options can be played alongside the more universal Dragonborn that would appear in a core book. Right. Uh, so again, people are gonna get to see uh, a whole new take uh, on the Dragonborn in the next UA, including also a new fun fifth level ability that kicks in for that universal Dragonborn. But we can talk about that in our next <laughs> video. Can't just tease. Yes, I'm a, I, am a, I am a dungeon master at heart, and part of being a DM is cliffhangers. So next time we'll talk about that. That's frustrating. Uh, okay. The, so the Ardling uh, here also. Once we dug into the written feedback, it was pretty clear what was going on, and I really loved the feedback we got. And that was that the Ardling was trying to do a few too many things. It was sort of both being a sort of a cousin to the Asamar, yeah. which by the way, we saw some questions of, is the Ardling replacing the Asamar? Right. Definitely not. The Asamar is still in the game. The Asamar is in Monsters of the Multiverse. Um, but again, there was this sense that it was sort of being a cousin to the Asamar while also being a beast person. And we saw much more interest in the feedback in the Ardling of leaning into the beast person side. Right. And so in the whole new take of the Ardling and the next Unearthed Arcana, people are going to see that, that its identity is much clearer. It's, it's the, the place it's filling in the multiverse, I think is definitely going to come into focus for people. I have seen it. It's uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You have read it. Um, so that's it. It was just those three things. Everything else was scored in the 70s or the 80s. Uh, and that's also an amazing amount of playtesters. Yes, yeah, the number of playtesters of, again, 39,000 people completing the survey is remarkable. Uh, and that's what I said, that that means these scores are persuasive. And I'll, I'll give a few more uh, that I think uh, will be fascinating to people. Okay, yeah. For as long as I've been working on the game, over multiple editions, the human is the most played. Now, the one bit that was very satisfying to me here that was a bit of a surprise was just how much people like this new take on the human. Uh, and so, yeah, the new human scored 83%. Wow. Uh, followed by um, four options that basically were virtually tied. The dwarf, the orc, the tiefling and the elf all were basically virtually tied 
hovering around 80 and 81 percent. I like tremor sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, and 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 then the the other two options. I mean, we've now talked about all of them except for the gnome and the halfling, and even the gnome and the halfling scored really well, tied at 78 uh, percent. So. A lot of, of, of excitement and positivity about these options, but also some great notes in the written feedback that we are analyzing and will incorporate into future versions of these, of these options. And again, people are going to get to see a new Ardling and a new Dragonborn uh, in our very next UA. So what are we seeing for future installments of UA right now for, for one d and playtest? So... In our next one, we have not only those, the new Ardling and the new Dragonborn, as well as a surprise guest, which we'll talk about also in our next video, but also we have a new version of the Cleric. Uh, and this UA will be a little shorter than our others. Uh, we've realized that the first two were really chunky. <laughs> and so they were big. <laughs> this one is still big, but a little smaller. Then the next one after that's going to get bigger again. Uh, and we will continue our journey through the classes. So, of course, we have still to go uh, the druid and the paladin uh, to accompany the cleric in the priest group. Uh, and then we have the warrior group and also the mage group uh, ahead of us. One of the things I am super excited about when we get to the warrior group UA is that's when we're going to dig deep into something I teased in the previous UA. In the previous UA, there's a sidebar that talks about what's ahead for the one D&D playtest. And one of the options that I saw online, some people did notice, is new weapon options for certain types of characters. Here's what that means. We are going to be unveiling with the new versions of the warrior groups whole new ways to use weapons. So one of those things we're going to dive into is going to be kind of your home base. Yeah, in the most recent UA, in that little preview of what's ahead, one of the things mentioned is there'll be new rules on managing your character's home base. This is going to be a new subsystem that DMs and players can decide to uh, whether they're going to implement it in their campaign or not. And if they do decide to, they're going to be able to create home bases with NPCs connected with them that end up implementing a number of our current downtime rules in the context of your home base and your group of NPCs. And that system we call the Bastion system. And next year we're gonna we're going to unveil what you're going to be able to do with that should your campaign uh, adopt it. I'm uh, very excited for this. Uh, I am too. We've had tons <laughs> of fun planning it out. Uh, but before we get there, we're focusing on the core character options of the game, uh, especially character classes, which means we also have, in the end, there will be a total of 48 subclasses that will appear in this playtest process, four for each of the game's 12 classes. We also are going to share with DMs new encounter building rules aimed at making it easier to prep and even more monster customization options, things that will make it easier for DMs to run this game. And so there is a whole lot ahead of us. Also mixed in will be new versions of things that appear in the playtest because a critical part of this is we send things out we get feedback, things that didn't score particularly well, we do new versions, we send those out, we get feedback on that. It's, it's, a, it's a process that is already bearing fruit. Uh, the feedback that people have given is already improving what's going on here, both at the, the macro level uh, with things like the Dragonborn and the Ardling, but also on the micro level, because since we dig into the written feedback that is provided, people are already telling us great things about wording in the rules glossary, for instance, that might be unclear to them. And so that's the playtest process working. We read it like, aha, we will improve this, meaning that when we get finally to the books in a couple of years, 
we will have been able to refine the wording of the rules, the character options, the DM options, incorporating feedback from tens of thousands of people. And that's, I mean, this is a very clear why it's so important for everyone to play test it and then give that feedback because it's clearly changing the process as we go. Absolutely. And it's even valuable to us if, say, a, a person doesn't have time to play test, it's still valuable for us to get feedback on the survey just based on the person's reading of the material. Uh, because we, we can tell when we're reading if feedback is based on real play experience versus first impression on reading. Feedback from both situations mm -hmm. is helpful to us. And so I encourage people, if you've at least read it, please fill out the survey. Even better if you've read it and you've tried some of it out in play, because we find all of our perceptions change once we get to the game table and we're rolling dice. Uh, but again, all of the feedback is helpful. This is something that's come up uh, a, a bit with the playtest material. If there is something absent, like the use object action or like Eldritch Blast, uh, does that mean that that's not going to exist? So that is a great question. And what I think is important to understand about the playtest is we're presenting a version of something and asking what people think of it with the assumption that if something doesn't appear in the playtest, it's still in the game. So people have rightly noticed that the Eldritch Blast spell has not appeared on any of the spell lists thus far. Eldritch Blast has not been removed from the game. It thank, just simply thank mean, you. <laughs> it just means it's not on those spell lists. Uh, and when we get to the Mage Unearthed Arcana, people will get to see what we're doing with Eldritch Blast in the Warlock. Uh, similarly, uh, the Use an Object to Action. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, several actions have not appeared yet in the glossary for the playtest. What that means is we're still using the action as it's defined in the 2014 Player's Handbook. Because typically we put things in the glossary only if we've changed right. the definition in some way, or if it's something that was never fully defined in the 2014 Player's Handbook. Because there are a few rules that didn't appear in the 2014 Player's Handbook, but did appear in the Monster Manual or Dungeon Master's Guide. And Essentially, our test is if it didn't appear in the pH and we want people to test it in the playtest, we put it into the glossary. Similarly, if we've changed it in some way, it goes into the glossary. That means if it's not there... Don't panic. Don't, it's, it <laughs> is still, it's still in the game until we say it isn't. Right. Now, people have, have rightly noticed that uh, the thief subclass in the previous UA doesn't as a part of their cunning action enhancement, interact with the use an object action anymore. That's intentional. Uh, that wasn't an accidental omission. Uh, we removed it from that feature because in the 2014 version of the feature, it fell into an area of mechanics that we sometimes refer to as mother may I mechanics. Mm. And what we mean by that is something that is on your character sheet that really only works if the DM cooperates with you in its execution. Right, right. This is as opposed to most of the features that characters have where you can reliably just use it and it does what it says on, on the description of the feature. Right. And we have found that in general, those sorts of mechanics that kind of require DM permission uh, or buy-in to function properly often end up being unsatisfying or they end up slowing down the game. And so for instance, what the thief could actually do with that bonus action, use an object action, caused endless questions. Partly because we weren't clear enough in the 2014 rules everything about what all is encompassed by use an object because you know we tell you well you can use an object with it but not a magic item and it's not entirely clear how the equipment in the equipment chapter interacts with that action 
all of that is on our list to clear up uh, in this playtest process. But specifically for the thief, we just simply, we didn't want that to be a part of that feature anymore. Right. Now, might the use an object action go away? It might. I'll, I'll be upfront about that. Uh, but we haven't decided yet. And that will be a decision we come to through the playtest process. Uh, and so again, if something is actually going to be removed from the game, we will say so. So again, if it's not present, it just means it's not in the playtest yet, or we're happy with its 2014 implementation. The journalist in me wants to ask about wild magic sorcery now. <laughs> Speaking of Mother May I, May well, I have a wild search. <laughs> and, and you can expect when we get to the mage classes and specifically to the sorcerer, we're going to address that. And you also saw in the previous Unearthed Arcana that we addressed that in the Ranger. Uh, because one of the main issues with especially the Ranger's first level features in the 2014 Player's Handbook is they relied way too heavily on DM buy-in. Mm. Uh, that if your DM really bought in to how they functioned, your Ranger could feel at first level super effective and later on feel like you had something to contribute that others didn't. Right. But if your DM didn't buy in, you could end up with a situation where you felt like those features didn't even exist in terms of actual play. Right. And so we've addressed that in the Ranger. Uh, Luckily, that isn't an issue for most of the features in the game, but when we come across them, we want to make sure one of our design goals is if you've got a class feature, you should be able to use it in the way you expect. Now, that still leaves things open for the DM to introduce in the environment, in the cosmos, something strange that alters how things work. But that's a different, that's a story thing, and that's totally within the DM's purview. That's different from the feature itself basically telling you, well, if the DM buys in, you'll get to use this. Uh, yeah. Another question that's really common is great weapon fighting and sharpshooter. Mm -hmm. So these feats have damage bonuses, many of which people enjoy, uh, with a little bit more risk-reward kind of action in their mechanics. Why was that changed? So... Yeah, in the 2014 versions of those two feats, they had the damage bonus that you talked about that was um, sort of counterbalanced with a penalty to your to-hit roll that you would adopt. Here's the issue. First off, the penalty to the to-hit roll, especially at higher levels, is not actually big enough to justify that large of a damage bonus. Uh, it becomes very easy as you progress to make that minus five to your attack roll trivial. But then there's an even bigger issue. We want our warrior classes in particular to be able to rely on their class features, which remember are going to include some of these awesome new weapon options. We want them to be able to rely on those for their main damage output. We do not want any feats to feel like you have to take them to yeah, be yeah. dealing a satisfying amount of damage. So really the issue with those two feats was twofold. Again, it was too easy to make the penalty to the to hit roll trivial. And those two feats with those really enticing damage bonuses in them almost became must-haves. And that for us uh, violates our design goal for feats, which is we always want you to feel good about the feats you took, but we don't want you to feel like you must take yeah. particular feats right. to hit a baseline level of whether it's damage output or if you're a healer, the amount of healing you do, or if you're an expert and you're much more about versatility. We want you to go to feats because there's a particular angle you want to accentuate, not because you feel like I've got to take this feat to even be able to show up and do my job. So fear not, uh, people who love playing uh, warriors, there is juicy stuff coming in the class.
classes themselves. And that's where we want you to be able to turn reliably to some options where you will be dishing out the damage. Uh, and, and again, that's one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to when uh, we release that UA. So there's, there's another one. There's the light weapon property mm -hmm. and having to do with bonus actions. Are, there, are we going to see other changes like this? And when, why was this changed? So the light weapon property, we really amped it up by removing the bonus action requirement. It's now you get this extra attack simply as a part of the attack action. Is that because of the threading of everything going through a bonus action? Yes, uh, because, and I think we might have talked about this in our video about this UA, requiring light weapon users to use their bonus action to yeah. get that extra attack meant that there were a lot of bad combinations with class features that also required bonus actions, spells that required bonus actions. It meant that people who really liked the fantasy of you know, fighting with two light weapons yeah. were sort of having to pay attacks that other weapon users were not having to pay. And so that's why we made that change because we noticed over time that that tax on light weapon use was actually causing us to sort of distort design decisions elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like we started flinching away from using the bonus action in a few cases, even though the bonus action was the most natural design choice, because then we're like, well, but then this will be rough for people who are using light weapons. So the play test is a, is a time for us where we can find a, how about we just fix the light weapon property so that it, it stops causing these ripples in the design environment so that a light weapon user can use these other options just as well as somebody else. So when, again, we get to uh, the warrior classes and we explore the new weapon options, we're also going to explore possibly tweaking some of the other weapon properties. But our focus is going to be more on these brand new options. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in the months ahead. Uh, another one of these things that came up was class spell lists. Are these going away forever? That's an open question. So our focus right now is getting everyone used to the three big spell lists, the arcane list, the primal list, and the divine list. Now, in the expert classes UA, we saw the bard and the ranger interacting with those lists, but with some uh, uh, sort of exceptions. You know, like, like the, each of them could pick only certain spells from whatever list they were going to. And we've definitely seen the feedback that for those two classes, it would be nice if they still had a class list that basically summarized mm -hmm. what they can pick uh, from the master list. We're definitely open to doing that. But what we really wanted to do is focus initially on showing people sort of how they get their spells from the master list. And we will definitely, as we build the books, look at ways to make the spell selection process even easier. And there's a good chance that will mean like the bard will have just a list that simply compiles all the spells that the bard can choose from. Now there are going to be other classes though where that won't be necessary. And people are going to see that in the cleric because the cleric can simply choose from the entire divine spell list. You're gonna see that also with the wizard who can choose from the entire arcane list. So it's going to be a class by class decision we make and it will really come down to is it too much of a headache to go through the list and then manually as a player exclude certain right, schools? Yeah. And I could definitely see that being a pain, in which case we are likely to give that class its own list that, again, is really just a summary of what's available to them from the master list. But then if a class like the cleric or the wizard can choose from an entire list, there'll be no need for us to have a class-specific list for them. This, by the way, is a part of the philosophy we've had all along for fifth edition. And that is, we're always looking to do what is right for a particular class. So what works for the bard may not work for the wizard. What works for the cleric may not work for the druid. 
And so we will, especially as we transition from this playtest and development process into building the actual books, look at making sort of user interface decisions that make the life of the players who play each class as friction-free as possible. Right, has this been exciting for you? Because like fifth edition has you know was around so long, and we've got one D and D you know taking you know this building off of that. Like there must have been stuff like you start picking up on year over year that you're like, oh, it, if only we could tweak it. <laughs> well, it, it is super exciting for me because I love this game. I love the game we've all been playing together for uh, the last eight years. But there are also things that I know could be faster, have more options, be clearer, uh, you know, have fewer places where you feel forced to make certain decisions. And so we're now able to address all of that through this process, continuing the conversation that we started with the D&D community back with the D&D Next Play Test process. And yeah, I'm, I am jazzed that we are going to continue this conversation uh, for more than a year uh, ahead of us. And that, that I think is a great, a great note to end on uh, today, is just to invite everyone to buckle in. This is, <laughs> this is going to be a, a long conversation. Yeah. We're gonna see different versions of things. If you spot something that's unclear, that's not resonating with you, please let us know in the survey because we're already we're, we're reading your feedback. We're already making improvements based on it. That is the process working as intended. It's meant to be a back and forth that will result in new versions of the core books that all of us as a community uh, can be excited about. So we really appreciate the comments and we appreciate any commentary on social media as well. But if you, you want your voice heard, the best way to do that is the survey. Absolutely. Filling out the survey is the most important part. We're not able to like look at every single comment that has been made on like this video or on social media. The best way is if you really want to affect the future of D&D, download the playtest material and then fill out that survey. Yes, because it, it's we have multiple members of our design team dedicated to going through survey responses. And so that, that is your direct conduit to our design team is filling out those surveys. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right.